Hey guys, Tim Durham with DroneMappingTools.com and in today's video, rather lengthy video, I'm going to take you through the complete process of doing a photogrammetry mission. We're going to go to the field. I'm going to show you how to set up the base unit, the rover unit, how to, uh, the settings I use for my Emlet RS2 units, collecting those points, doing the logging, doing the flight, and um, coming back and processing the data. So I'm going to take you through every bit of it. It's going to be a long video, but for somebody that has questions and doesn't fully understand the process of photogrammetry, this video is going to be very helpful. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time and finally got the time to do it. So I hope it's very helpful. Today, I flew, or well, the day that I flew, I flew with the Topo Drone Mavic 2 Pro PPK. Is that drone new? No, it's been out for, I don't know, two, three years maybe. But the accuracy on that you're going to see is just, it's unbelievable. It is outstanding. And one of the things that's kind of important is because I'm going to show you the Topo Drone um, Air 2S PPK will be coming out in two weeks. And this drone is going to be the most affordable PPK system that's going to be on the market. So we're going to be glad to be providing those and shipping those out here in the United States. So if you're looking for a very cost-effective but very accurate PPK drone, then this is going to be it. The camera that's on this is almost identical to what is on the Mavic 2 Pro. So again, follow me today with this uh, video that I've done, and I'm going to show you the complete process for photogrammetry. I'm going to show you the difference in using the PPK system versus just the standard Mavic 2 Pro images that were taken without any post-processing. So let's dive into this video. I hope it's helpful. And if so, give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Let's get going. All right, so in today's video, we are going to walk through every single step of doing a photogrammetry mission. You know, it's about 10 acres, so it's not large. You may have been charged with the task of taking over photogrammetry for your company. You may be a one-man show and you've been doing real estate stuff and you're ready to step up your game and offer uh, new services to your surveyors and engineering firms and contractors or what have you. But regardless of the reason, if you're here, it's because you are wanting to learn how to do photogrammetry. And uh, photogrammetry is, in some regards, more, it, it can have more difficult aspects of it than LIDAR. Um, LIDAR allows you to do a lot of things and when you're getting into photogrammetry what's really too in, uh, important to understand and know is that it has limitations. There are areas where photogrammetry does really good and there's places where you can't use it at all. And so if you're wanting to create uh, contours and topographical maps of places that have a lot of vegetation, a lot of trees, photogrammetry is not going to work. However, if you have places where you have parking lots, manicured lawns, roadways, uh, maybe you're doing 3D modeling. Photogrammetry covers a lot of stuff, so there's people that really specialize in 3D modeling. So in that regards, it could be very good uh, for that kind of stuff. But again, when you get into high vegetation, a lot of vegetation, a lot of trees, other than creating an orthomosaic map, which is when you know what I tell people is a satellite, a high resolution satellite image, because my end customers don't know what an orthomosaic map is. But when um, when you are generating just an orthomosaic map for a client, that that's all they need, so that's not relating to survey and contours and that kind of thing, then sure, then you can do it anywhere. Um, you can still have issues with it stitching properly. Uh, depending on how high you fly. So if you fly too low over uh, a lot of tall trees, then you're gonna have problems. Windy days present a problem. Um, anyway, 
So let's dive in, let's get started. I'm gonna walk you through every step. If you already know how to do the steps I'm doing, just advance through, go to the next uh, segment. I'll try to have everything done on a timeline to say what we're covering, but I'm gonna try to cover every single thing so that I don't leave anything out. You know, most of the feedback I've gotten over the years that people do want to see a detailed video. So let's stop talking, let's get into it and set it up. All right, so when you come out to a site, you are, if you're doing this for a survey or engineering firm, they're gonna have benchmarks. And you've seen the benchmark that I have. And so when you get ready to set your, your tripod up, we're gonna be having the Emlid RS2. Now, I actually have a laser plummet. So some of the old, uh, well not old, but they still sell these tribracks that have uh, optical plummets on them where you have to look through an eyepiece to see uh, to see your your benchmark and so what you're trying to do what you want to do is you are going to I'm going to turn my laser on and I, I get it to where it's pretty level right and so I come and then I, I get it to where it's kind of set up I'm going to have one leg I'm going to have one leg that's mashed in the ground now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take I take these two feet right here and with that laser I can find my laser. Where did my laser go? Oh, there it is. Okay, now I move these two legs until that laser is dead on. I'm not even, it doesn't have to be perfectly level, but I want to take these two feet with that one planted in the ground and I move it to where this laser is on the benchmark. If you're using an optical plummet, you're going to have to get down and look through and move it until it is dead center and that's where I'm going to stop. So it's not level, but I'm over, I'm actually over my benchmark. So I'm going to go ahead and mash these in the ground. Now that that is dead center and you also want to make sure that this tribe rack is, is in the center of um, your, your top plate. You don't want, we're not going to want to have this thing uh, slid off the plate. It's kind of skating. We don't want that. We want to have, we're going to want to have it almost as centered as it can be. Now we're going to have some latitude to kind of move it around and get it perfectly centered. But now what I'm going to do is I want to get it, I want to get it centered up. So I'm going to do my rough centering with my legs. And when I put this up, I did not put my, uh, I did not fully extend the legs. I left a little bit of room so that so that I had room to, to make adjustments. All right. All right, let's see. All right, there's that. Again, I'm just going to get it to where that bubble is almost pretty close to being dead center. Now, now I'm going to use my... Uh, and I'm still pretty close. Oops, let's go back. Right there. Okay. Now I'm perfectly leveled up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. I'm going to move it just a hair so that I'm now, my laser, once I got it perfectly level, now I moved it to where my laser is now dead center of the benchmark. And then I'm going to tighten it up underneath. Not too tight, just enough to snug it. You do not want to crank it down. And that's it. I can turn my laser plummet off. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and take a reading. Now, I could even go as far as to take this off and take the reading. I use a laser. A lot of guys, the old school, they just use a, a tape. Yes, if I measure from here to right there, there's going to be a little bit of difference because we're at a slight angle. When you're doing uh, contours and your uh, specs are within a foot, it is not going to hurt for me to do a, a measurement because we're gonna be in the millimeters difference that I'll have because of the triangulation. But I'm gonna measure from this top plate to my benchmark. And then once I have that measurement, I will add 0.377 meters to that because that's the distance from here up to the bottom of the antenna. I already, I know that. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick measurement. Got it on the beam right there. Okay, now so it's 1.195. 
So what I always do, since I'm, and you can get these, this is a, a Leica, but Disto, but you can get basic laser measures uh, that's gonna be accurate. I will, I'm gonna add, it's got a calculator function, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna add point, it was 1.195. And so now I'm gonna add 0 0.377 to that. So I'm gonna plus 0.3, seven seven and equals that's 1.572 i'm going to take a picture of this so that i that i remember um, you can also log let me get to where the sun there we go all right and then once i get the base set up actually i'll even go ahead and just snap a picture so that i know where i had my base so i now have recorded the 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 uh, value that was in there, the 1.572. I'm gonna cut that off and go put it up. I'm now gonna get the base unit mounted up, turned on, and then I'm gonna set an alarm on my phone. I wanna let it sit there and run for five minutes before I start logging. I let it warm up. But always, always, always put an alarm on your phone that says, remind me in five minutes to start logging. I wish that Emlid would allow that to be part of the firmware to where when you booted it up that it automatically started logging after a certain amount of time. Emlid, if you watch this, would you please add that? Because that would just be so easy to have a timer that once it once it boots up and it's on, that you say just start logging after five minutes. So anyway, I'm gonna go get it and let's uh, get that thing put on and keep going. All right. For any of you that's ever seen my sidekick Minnie, come on Minnie, get over here. She's she's trying to run, run around. All right, so I've got it here. If you want to really be technical, the 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 uh, the face, the power button should face the north. That's the when you look at the uh, like the guys that um with Opus they have in their database that this the the. The, this is your reference point, but then the face should actually face the north. So I'm gonna have mine always facing to the north. So you have to hold your power button on the Reach RS2, and then it will boot up. And so what I'm gonna do, let me get my phone. Hey Siri. Hey Siri. Set an alarm for five minutes to start logging the base. I set your start logging the base alarm for 11.54 a.m. Done. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and get my rover turned on. So even though I'm not uh, ready to do ground control points just yet, I'm still gonna go ahead and turn it on so that it's logging. And so, turned on I'm gonna go ahead and set it so mine is at this is a 12 centimeter offset on the uh, on the pole all right all right got it so this is now set at two meters I'm just gonna go set it over on the grass near the base I'm just gonna let it run okay so the base is set up it's on the rover set up it's on we'll start logging those momentarily so uh, we're gonna go ahead and get the drone. Actually, no, I need to get targets established. We're gonna use some of the parking lot. I'll throw just a few targets out in the grass, but we're gonna get our targets put out. Uh, and when you are out, when you go somewhere and you have parking lot and roadways, man, those are your friends. You can use the, the parking stripes. You've got uh, stop sign stripes. You got all kinds of stuff on the roadways that are very visible in your images and they make for great ground control points so we'll go ahead and set some out and then we'll be ready to start flying so now when you come out to do control points one of your best friends is a piece of chalk let me uh snooze that i don't want to turn it off a piece of chalk yes you can paint stuff on the uh the roadway but you know some people might not appreciate you painting on their uh parking lot but what you do is you take a piece of chalk and then we're going to draw a circle around a uh, an intersecting white line but then also draw a little short line sh reminding myself which corner because if you've got a cross you, and we're off a little bit when we get ready to um, match everything up you, you can't remember well, which corner did i actually use 
Well, we'll take this, we'll draw a little hash mark. It will point to the corner that I actually set up to be the control point. So let's go ahead and start marking some. Hey, Minnie. All right, so there's that. And like I said, I'll do that right there. And that lets me know that corner is gonna be the one that we're gonna set up on. And it'll be just very, very clear in the pictures. Now, for the sake of looking at accuracy, I'm actually gonna come over here and I'm gonna do another one right here. We'll do it on that side. And so later we're gonna look at the accuracy of that line in the point cloud and see, well, how accurate is our point cloud data? So we'll go over and find some more. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go mark some points. You ready to do some GCPs, huh? You wanna do some ground control points? Come on, come on, let's go get some ground control points. That's right, yeah. Many likes to help do some ground control points. All right, so again, we've got this nice big stop sign. Now you see that corner is kind of jacked up. So what I'm gonna do, I wanna do this corner right here. Right there. There's that corner. And then we'll come over and we're gonna do, do that corner right there. Okay, that's smart. All right, so we've got this parking lot right here. Now these are older stripes. They're not as, as white, but that's okay. They will, they will still work. All right, now one thing, uh, what I'm not sure, I need to look at my flight plan. I may have went across the street and mark some and we're going to do that corner right there we're going to come down to this end i'm going to mark that corner right there i'm going to pull that weed out should have picked it better there we go that'll clean that up all right, so again, now I'm, I'm walking around with this camera. What I normally do is that I would, I would take a picture. Well, actually I'll take my picture when I'm uh, surveying. So disregard that. All right, so here's one more. Come on. right there, okay, there's another pair. All right, so you know you can see this is level, and then we have this ditch right down here. You always want to have control points that are high and low. So this is very wet because we got about I don't know two to three inches of rain last night. It was a gully washer, but we'll come back and mark that. All right, so the alarm is going off, and let me tell you, if you do not set an alarm you will one day get busy and you forget to log and if you don't log your mission is ruined so i'm gonna go uh i'm gonna hit snooze but go turn my logs on all right so we are going to go to settings i am going to i need to connect from the unit and actually connect to my base the unit is my wi-fi device that i keep in the car so i'm now connected to the base unit so now i'm going to open up reach view three and we see the base there, okay? Now I've done another video where I ran through my settings, but I'll just real quickly do that again. So we don't need general, the only thing we really, so I have a SIM card in here. Um, you know, they, they use up to three and a half G cards and later this year, those three G service will be discontinued in the US, maybe in 2024. So I'm hoping that MLID will push out some updated or send out updated modems we can stick in so anyway let's close that so let's get down to where it really counts we'll go to gnss settings and for i have them all set now this is not what's going to be for for opus so i'm going to have two logs but this is just the uh the ubx file I have it set to static you see my elevation i have all of them and i'm logging at one hertz okay so there's that now um, let's go to, that's really it. That's all we need to deal with. Base mode, this, I do have RTK service, although I don't use RTK, but I do have it. And I have cards in there in case I just ever needed it. But it is set to average after five minutes and one second of receiving a fix. 
So that's already done. So it has a fix. So let's go back. Now what we really want to do is go to, uh, no, go back and let's go to logging. And I'm going to turn logging on. So let's go to settings. Now we can see that I have, I once said custom, uh, that, that is not, that's not the best. Just select Opus and select Rhinex 211 if you're here in the States. I use GPS only and I have it set to a 30 second interval which is adequate for Opus. And um, you do want to use the antenna height and so you will recall that I... So I took a picture of that. Let me see what it is really quick. Photos. 1.572. It's always going to be, you know, when you set this thing up over and over and over it's always gonna be pretty close seven two and we're gonna call this um, photogram tutorial okay all right so I'm gonna hit apply and so now what's gonna happen is when I hit start recording it's going to record two files. It's going to record an Opus, a file. It's a Rhinex file. It's not an Opus. It's a Rhinex file that is suitable for Opus to process. And Opus can only process dual receiver um, data. So if you have the RS Plus, you cannot use Opus. But the RS2, you can. It's an L2 receiver. But it's also logging the UBX file with all the satellites included at a one second interval. So both of those are being logged uh, simultaneously. So I'm going to close out of that and we are done with the reach view three. Okay, so that one's done. Now what I have to do, let me, I'm going to close it too. I'm going to go to settings. I need to switch over to my rover. Okay, we're still recording. I just want to make sure. All right, I'm going. I'm connected to the rover, and so now I go back to Reach View Three. And this one here, the settings are, they're they're the same. So I'll still show you that. I'm gonna to go to settings, my GNSS settings. It's gonna be all of them are gonna be selected, and I'm gonna be set at one hertz. That is all you need. Except this one is set to kinematic. So my rover is kinematic. My base station is set to static. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to go back by clicking on the top left arrow and I'm going to logging. And now we're just going to start logging because my settings are just UBX. That's all I want. So I hit start recording. And there you go. So we are now logging on both my base and my rover. So we, we are done. So I'm going to close this out. I'm actually just going to close the program because I don't need it anymore for right now until we go back and do our ground control points. And then I can, uh, I'll just turn my Wi-Fi off for right now. And that's it. So we're, we're done for that. Now we're ready to get our drone up in the air and uh, start flying. When it comes to doing photogrammetry, aerial mapping, whatever you want to call it, there are tools that are going to separate hobbyists from people that are doing it professionally. And there are a lot of people that do photogrammetry on a hobby level. They love it. It is just, it's something they do. But they're not out doing survey work. They might create um, for a number of reasons, maybe just personal, you name it. There are people that do uh, 3D modeling. Uh, that, that's kind of a whole different aspect of itself. I mean, there's a lot of techniques that go into creating a very good 3D model. So what I really specialize and provide services for is doing topographical surveys and contours for surveying and engineering firms in the Memphis area. And let's say you've been doing some drone work and you start hearing about mapping. You go, man, I'd, I'd like to do that. I want to make some money doing that. There are necessary tools that you're going to have to have in order to be able to do that because anybody with a drone and some free software can go fly an automated mission, stitch the images together and go, hey mom, look what I just did. And you can do that. It, that's not hard. When you get ready to provide 
data to surveyors, engineers, and construction companies that it has to be, I mean, it has to be very accurate. When you are going to get into photogrammetry on a professional level, you have to have, at the minimum, you're going to have, to have a GPS unit to serve as a base. You got to have a base unit, and then you're going to have, to have a rover for checking, doing your uh, ground control points. Now, you could, you could get away. So let's say you have a drone that doesn't have, it's, it's just the Mavic 2 Pro. Pretend this isn't on it, it's just the Mavic 2 Pro, and you're gonna go fly that. If you're flying just a drone with no PPK kit, you're gonna have to have your base unit, and you're gonna have, to have a rover unit to go check your ground control points, because you will have to use those ground control points all throughout the site to try to bring that map into being accurate. And it will be very accurate at the ground control points, and as you move away from them, the accuracy will start to drift. So there are issues there. If you have a drone that is a PPK setup, and it can be, you know, what's the best is the Topo drone setup, but let's say you even had a, a MLID M2 that was, uh, or an M Plus that was added on a Phantom 4, use a snap-on kit. There are issues with that, with missed photos and extra events that you have to deal with, but you, you can, you can make it work. This right here is the cream of the crop. But if you have one of these, at the very minimum, you still have to have a, a base station that is, you would like to have a base station that's fairly close. It's a L2 receiver, so you technically could have a, what, a 60 mile baseline but having a base unit on site would be ideal and then you also need to do ground a few ground control points companies will tout that hey this is so accurate you don't need ground control points never ever ever would i recommend that you turn something in to a surveying and engineering company that you didn't have control points to validate that your data is accurate i don't care how accurate it is i will never ever turn something in without ground control points and checkpoints. So uh, another video will explain, you may use ground control points to still tighten your data up and then you have checkpoints that were just not even used for the, the, the sole purpose in them is to check the accuracy. I have a log book. So I come out, I log the weather, the wind, the ground, whether the ground is wet, dry, moist, whatever the time I start, what I'm using for ground control points, the equipment I'm flying. So I have a book that I log so that I turned a copy of that into the surveying company when I submit my final deliverables. And that's something you need to do. So when a surveyor goes out to do a, a boundary or do anything, they have a log book. And so you will want to do the same thing. It doesn't have to be super complicated, but you need to log what you're doing, where you're at, the equipment you're using, etc. Huh, okay, so I kind of babbled on, but you need, I've kind of established that you, you, it's best to have a base unit on site, but if you're in the United States, we have a very good CORS network. And so you can use that CORS network to post-process a PPK drone but you also need to have a unit that you can check ground control points with. And so at the very least, you still have to have one unit, one GPS unit, like the RS, I would still recommend the RS2. You could possibly, you could get away with using the MLID M2 and put on a, uh, like a Swift um, GPS 500 uh, antenna. That'd be a little cheaper than the RS2. Um, wouldn't look as glamorous, but um, anyway, it would it could probably still get the job done. Next, you have to have processing software. So when you are going back to the office, what separates the the pricing on photogrammetry is the ability to use ground control points. The free software, the free, almost free, very cheap. It will always be limited to the number of images you can process. That'll be one limit. And the other is you can't use ground control points. So if you can't use ground control points, processing in that software is not gonna do any good. 
it is just it's not you you have to be able to validate what you just flew and what you're turning in and so you've got a lot of i mean there's there's a lot so you've got um 3df um zephyr pro you got pix 4d you got um agisoft 3d survey and there's going to be a host of others those are going to be probably the what i would consider the top players and you know price wise they're going to be in that 35 hundred to forty five hundred dollar range and so um that is that's just the fact that if if you're going to get into doing this you either have to buy that software and then you also have to have the, the computer that will will run it or you do the processing online you do cloud processing and if you do cloud processing then you're going to pay a you know a pretty decent fee for that so um but that's a good way to get started because now you didn't sink a whole bunch of money into software. You get to do, uh, it could either based on a per job or a per month with a limit, but you have to make sure that you can use ground control points. And, and generally speaking, if you're gonna use cloud service and the ability to have ground control points, you are gonna pay a premium for that service. So you have the cloud processing for just basic photogrammetry down here. And then once you get to the, when you say, oh, I need to use ground control points, your price level just went double. So I hope that's helpful. I've rambled on, but I hope that just explains some of the, the stuff you need. And when I'm in the office, I will show you the software that I use and you know what some of it is beneficial for different things. And uh, I'm gonna try to show you what maybe just a, a bare minimum that you have to have to get by and um, anyway so I, I hope that'll be helpful and I can show you more there but let's go ahead and get this thing in the air so we can start flying we got about a 18 minute flight this is going to be double grid again I'm going to take this up I'm going to use I'm going to manually set my focus and my aperture in DJI go and then I will switch over to drone deploy I'll fly the mission and then we'll go collect our ground control points and get out of here I can't do a screen recording, but we're gonna go ahead and take off. And I'm gonna ascend to 200 feet. Cause that's gonna be the altitude of my mission. All right, now, All right, we're auto focus. I'm gonna to switch to manual focus. That's good. On exposure, I'm at one. Um, actually, we're good. We're at one uh, one five hundred. The minimum you want is one six hundred of a uh, of a second. So five six. And I'm at uh, ISO one hundred, which you really need. So we're gonna to go to one. Oops. All right, one one six forty ISO. We're good there. Five six one six forty. I think I think that's good. So we should be good. So now what I'm going to do is switch over to uh, drone deploy. I have everything set the way I want it. So now we're going to go to drone deploy. I already laid this mission out in the office. Again, double grid. All right, come on, drone deploy. Yeah, we're gonna bring this in, maybe, just maybe. You can see part of it, we'll see. Let's try it one more time. Flight. Problem is, this is an 18 minute flight. I'm gonna run out of my battery because it's not starting you know why here we go i know why turn wi-fi off i was probably hooked up to the um i was i was connected to my rover which does not share the internet access and so therefore it couldn't it couldn't log on because drone deploy okay photogrammetry tutorial here we go and uh enhance we don't want that 
Now that is, this is supposed to be a double grid mission. Yep, cross hatch, okay. So if it's cross hatch, why? Okay, I had to do, that's why. All right, so we're at 200 feet. We are ready to go and I'm going to go ahead and start the mission. It does not exceed the radius. Oh my goodness, come on. And if I get that error again, I'll have to log back on to DJI. Test photo failed, retry. We're about to be ready to go. Okay, so it is now gonna go to the mission. This is roughly 10 acres. And so this is running, this is not at 90 degrees either, so. All right, so I brought it back down to uh, change batteries. I needed to, uh, I had mistakenly, I had the, I did not want the camera tilted. Uh, I wanted 90 degree uh, down, so uh, straight 90, nadir, and anyway, so I brought it down, switch out the battery, and so now we're gonna let it run the mission. We'll bring it back in. I'll do the control points, check those, and then uh, we'll go to the office and finish up there. so we are now at the first ground control point and I will not record every single point but I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a couple just to show you because this is just rinse and repeat every time so I'm now getting the got the screen recording going so the first thing we have to do is we got to get connected turn Wi-Fi on and then I'll get connected to my rover Okay, now I want to open up Reach View. I'm gonna... My sidekick Minnie, um, who decided to stay in the car, but she stepped all over my tablet the other day and got it muddy. All right, so we already logging. So now we're gonna come down to survey and I'm gonna do a new survey and we're going to always, always do mine with the date. Dash O four dash. Today is the 14th. And uh, this is the photogrammetry tutorial. All right. I, I think it's always good to use the, uh, to use the date. Okay. Oops. All right, we're gonna save. All right, so we already established I'm at two two meters. You want to make sure if you're in if you're working in feet, then just whatever. But make sure you have that set correctly. So when I open this up, you can see right here my my pole is set to two two meters. So that is correct. Sometimes I'll even go so far as to take a picture of my pole just so I know that I have it. But one thing I am gonna do is I'll step back and I'm gonna take a picture of the, every time when I not when I do topo point or checkpoints but when I do ground control points I always take a picture every single time now for the sake of this I am going to okay 30 seconds we're good I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do one every 30 seconds and that ought to be good when I go out I, I generally will do two minutes like if I'm gonna have 10 ground control points um, if I'm where I'm gonna have to have a whole bunch I mean, the fact is, I will cut it down. You know, it's uh, when you do 30 seconds wide open, it's on a bipod, 30 seconds is going to be ample. It's not moving. Uh, we will have a fix uh, in 30 seconds. So that is actually going to be good. So it's done. Now we're going to step over here. So, boom. Again, moving over to this one. And again, I have these lines. Now, what I'm doing, my lights, the lights on this are facing to the north. If you, if you just have it facing the same way every time, if you had an error in your uh, level vial, the bubble, 
your arrow will be, be consistent throughout your entire job. So you always want to have your, um, okay, what happened here? Give me one second. Okay, so I'm going to measure. You, you always want to have it, if you have it facing the same way, then the, that does away with any error, or it keeps the error the same. It is the consistent, provided that you are meticulous about leveling. If this is off, then it'll be the same for every point. Second is that now we have a little bit of a breeze out of the north. Uh, if it was much of a breeze at all, you always want your legs downwind so it doesn't blow it over. And if it's really high winds, I mean, one, it can kind of move it uh, and cause movement, but having that on the backside will prevent that and just keep it from being blown over and busting on the concrete. That would make for a bad day. So anyway, this is it. We are gonna do rinse and repeat every single point. So I don't need to uh, sit here and record every single point, but I will go collect every one of them. Then uh, we'll do a video as we're breaking it down, close our log files, and then we'll finish up in the office. All right, so the last thing I usually do is I'll actually take one point literally right at my base. Basically, I'm closing out, you know, I'm uh, five inches from the pin. And so the um, elevation, everything I did, I ought to come in right where my base is at. So that just kind of lets me know that everything is processing, post-processing accurately and like it should. All right, so we are done. I'm going to cl click on the X to close it out exit out of projects i want to go to receivers so the very last thing we're going to do is we're going to turn off the logging but you always always do your rover first so we are connected to the rover so i'm gonna to go to logging hey manny what are you doing are you sad because we're almost done for many this is fun she likes to come out and play don't you Minnie? Huh? okay so i'm gonna turn that off hour and 36 minutes and of course we had some uh 15 minutes so i was out here an hour and 45 minutes 10 acres i'm trying to record i mean you could come out here and do this well a whole lot faster than that but uh i'm trying to do extra stuff so all right we're done there so now i'm gonna click on rover again and then i can power it down down here at the bottom so i'm gonna click on shut down don't want to shut it down yes i do and now that will be shut down i'll go ahead and close the reach view app now when I go to my, all right, let's set that one out of the way. Okay. Now, and what I've done some, what I've done sometimes in the past is I would actually do a survey on the base itself so that that was my way of logging what my antenna height was. But as long as you take a picture on your cell phone and that's getting uploaded to your, I don't know, Google Drive or however you save your photos. I mean, I do have a record. So when I took a picture of the laser measure, that was me documenting what my antenna height. It is not a bad idea to just do a, a survey, a one second survey point, and, and you literally log what your antenna height was. But, so we're gonna, let's go back to uh, settings. I need to switch back over to the base. Connected. Now I go to Reach View 3. There it is. I'm going to click on Base. Now I'm going to have to hit Refresh again. So sometimes when you're switching back and forth, it takes just a second. So I am connected to the base. So now I'm going to go back into Reach View 3, and this time will be fine. Like I said, a lot, if you just switch immediately and go really fast, sometimes you can have a little, little hiccup there. All right, so I'm going to go back into my logging. And we'll see that it'll take just a second. It'll pop up red. You open it up and you think, oh, it's not recording, but it is. And now it's an hour and 40 minutes, so I'm going to hit stop. And then we switch down to the bottom. You see it's compressing. So the, the Rhinex file was very small because it was only once every 30 seconds. The, the UBX file is much larger because it's on a one second interval. So it'll take just a second longer. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so same thing. I'm gonna click on reach base again. Down at the bottom, I'm gonna click shutdown. 
yes shut down and that's it that powers it off and I'll stop our recording here all right so that's it this is a wrap in the field i'm going to put everything in the car pack it up and we'll take it to the office we'll take it to the office but actually we'll post process tomorrow because you usually have to wait to the following day um, or you could and like we did it early today it might be tonight before the um, logs are ready from the cores station uh, but we'll, we'll process it tomorrow and the video will be ready tomorrow with all the results all right see you in the office All right, so when you get back in the office and you have both your RS2 or RS uh, Plus units, you're gonna to wanna to power them back up and you will make sure that they are not connected to a, uh, a Wi-Fi device. I never connect them to my home Wi-Fi because if you ever need to run out and do a quick test on something, uh, it can create problems. So just connect it to your phone hotspot and um, well, it'll just be smoother, trust me. I am connected to the base right here, okay? So this is uh, connected, there's no internet connection because I don't have internet sharing turned on even though it has a data card. Now, one thing you wanna do is anytime you do missions, you will have a folder structure and I would do something like this. And I have extra ones because this is a tutorial but you will always have your RS2 base, RS2 rover, your photos that you take of your ground control points, uh, possibly on your phone. Um, in this case, I have my Mavic 2 map images are gonna go in this folder. The PPK files that were on the Topo Drone PPK system are in this folder here, okay? Um, and of course, I have my tablet recording in the field, GoPro, and my iPad mini. So those are extra. Now, in the rover, we will, and I'll show you this in a minute, we're going to download the um, CSV file from where we did our uh, survey because that is on the tablet. So I actually had that on the tablet, recorded that. And normally, I can either use, I'll use my phone because it's very small, or I have a small uh, Android tablet. But uh, today I use my bigger one because it's more suitable for doing a screen recording. So anyway, doesn't matter which one you use, I'll show you how to pull that off uh, and either email it to yourself or push it up to Google Drive and then pull it back down here. So let's get this out of the way. We are now connected. And so what I'm gonna do is come to logging. And today we have a log, I'm gonna download both of these. Okay, so I'm gonna click on, one is the UBX file. And let's do, um, let's go to YouTube tutorials and it's going to be under photogrammetry and it's going to be under RS2 rover. No, I'm sorry. This is my base. It's going to be RS2 base. And this is the UBX. So I'm going to save that. And then now I'm going to come and do the Rhinex file just the same. This is the one we'll push up to Opus and just um, see what Opus comes back with. So now I'm going to save that one. And that's it. I'm done. There's nothing else to do. It, you can either go push the button on the machine and, and turn it off. Actually, let's make sure they're not through downloading just yet. Okay, now it is. So I didn't want to turn it off before it finishes that. I'm going to click on this little button here to bring you just to the main uh, control panel. Here's where you can like turn your lights on and off and do some other stuff. But um, right here and by the way it's like this night mode if you ever have it out at night and you don't want it lit up so people see your gps unit and come take it then you can uh turn that on and that'll turning it on will turn the lights off but uh anyway so now i'm gonna click on power and shut down and then that'll turn that unit off and we are done with that one now i would uh minimize this screen, or not minimize, I would close it. We'll close that. Now we're gonna switch over, and we're gonna switch over to our rover. I'm gonna connect. Again, I don't ever choose connect automatically because I wanna have full control over that. 
Okay, we are now connected. I'm going to open up Firefox. Now, in some cases, it is good. Okay, it does say Rover, so that is good. I'm going to go to Status. Yep, everything's everything's working. Sometimes if it's cached, you may want to uh, force it to refresh so that you know you're pulled. You're not looking at a cached page from the unit you had open previously. So again, we're going to go to Logging today. All we have to do is, uh, uh, this is not right. So see, I'm going to, I got to refresh. That was cache data from the base. Now, this is today. So that's what I was telling you. You need to refresh to make sure you are looking at good data. All right, now I'm going to download, because I knew I only had just the one UBX file, RS2 Rover, and we'll save the UBX. Save it there. Let's take a look because it shouldn't have gone that quick. RS2 Rover, but it did. Interesting. Okay, I would have thought it would have taken just a smidge longer, but that is that is good. So we're we're done. There's nothing else that we need from here. So again, I'm gonna do the same thing. Click there. Come over to the top right hand corner. Click on the power button. Click on shutdown. And then that'll shut it down. I'll close it. And we're done with that. So we'll move on to the next step. All right. So uh, one thing I need to show now is when you need to send or upload the survey file that you did on your smart tablet, either phone or tablet, either one. So I have my tablet here that I use for doing tutorials and tests. So yesterday was the photogrammetry tutorial and so I'm going to click the little three dots. I'm going to click on export. I want to export the CSV. Now if you had specific file formats you want to do you could choose that but I always do the CSV. And now the simplest way to do it is to simply do uh, send yourself an email. Okay so and let's send that to Mid-South Drone Services. And we're just going to call this Photogrammetry Tutorial GCPs. That's it. Hit send. Bam, I just sent that file to myself. So we are good and we will now just bring that in on the system when we get ready to process. And that's all we needed. So I'm gonna show you every time I do stuff, I now submit my base file to Opus. So even though I use a software called EasyServe, I still take my base and submit it to Opus because I just like to compare, well, what did Opus show compared to what EasyServe did. And so I have the Rhinex file pulled right here. So again, you recall we logged two files were being logged on the base unit. One was a Rhinex file in Rhinex version 2.11. And in the ReachView app, we selected Opus. And then it also logged the UBX file that we could use for other software. But when you use Opus, it has to be in a 30 second interval and it needs to be in a Rhinex format. So I'm gonna drag in, uh, let's see, I don't think, no, well, we can't drag. It would be nice if you could just, well, yeah, you can too now, but you can't just drag over. Let me show you something. Emlid, if you are watching this, you please need to fix the format so that it has, um, it, it can't have hyphens. You rename it so where it has RS2 dash base and I'll show you. I'm just going to go ahead and go through the process so we get the error and it's all because they're renaming the file with a with a hyphen in there and you can't have that. But anyway, so right here it wants to know what is your antenna. We're using the Emlet email so just type that in. My antenna height to the uh, reference point which is the bottom of your antenna was 1.592 right there. This is the email and there's really no other, I don't need any um, 
trying to think. Were we? I was under two hours, and so I'll have to use the rapid static. If you if you uh, observe over two hours, then you can use a static, which uh, you know that's to some degree it's going to be quote more accurate. But uh, rapid static uh, in many cases is just probably within millimeters. So anyway, let's go ahead and choose on uh, use rapid static and then see what it says. File name contains invalid characters. So every single time I have to do this, I have to take my observation file, rename it right here and go to underscore. Okay, now I can drag it up right there. Now it will accept that. And when you when you submit this, um, if you have errors, you'll get an email. It won't tell you right away, but you'll get an email almost within minutes that says there was an error. And it'll tell you what the error was. But if you save it in Rhinox 211, um, generally speaking, if unless you were just unless you set up in a bad spot, um, you you will probably be good. So I'm gonna hit upload to rapid static. And that's it. So now within probably two minutes, we will get an email in that um, has that. So I'll open it up and show you what that email looks like. All right, so when you receive your email from Opus, and again, this came in very quick, I'm gonna say within four minutes, this is the format that you're gonna receive it in. And so they're gonna give you coordinates in a, in a couple different ways here. So you're gonna have NAT83, and then the uh, ITRF 2014. But one of the things you really have to know is that if, if the surveyor says, hey, Bob, yes, I can use your service. I've got three benchmarks set up. Here's the CAD drawing. It shows you where the marks are, and you're going to set up over one of them, and then you will survey the other two with your rover. Um, but you have to know exactly what reference system they're using. And so nine times out of 10 or probably 99 out of 100, it's going to be NAT83, but you can't assume. And so when you're doing your processing, when you start to create your control point or uh, your your ground control points, when you're processing those, you have to know what you're working in. So anyway, but this right here, this is the lat long and ellipsoid height. But again, this is in NAT83. And then over here, you see in the uh, ITRF, for 2014, and then on down below, we are in UTM and then state plane, but again, all based off of NAT83. Now, I'm going to show you something. I'm, I've done, I've processed this um, because I want to be able to show you uh, something that's very important. Then we're going to walk through, I'm going to take you through the processing, but before we do, it is so important that you just understand that details details matter and you you have to you can't just feed numbers into a system they spit them out and you just you just run with it as the gospel you have to learn to to really look and make sure that things match up that there has not been an error and so the antenna height for the the reach so when you use third party software the, the reach view app automatically adds the, the phase center offset. So the 0.134, which is from the bottom of the antenna to the, to the center, what is called phase center. And actually there, there's two, you have the L1 and L2, but they use the 0.134 as the value that gets added from the bottom up to the phase center. The reach view app adds the 0.134 into the survey file. Well, if you use third-party software, like I use EasyServe, or you use something else, um, when you do that, I have the antenna model is selected in that software. So what happened was it added, I had already two centimeters that I made an error in entering the base. Then when I brought it into easy serve and processed it had an additional uh, basically 13 centimeters difference and so the reason that i go and take my rover and i put it at the base unit and and survey it 
is because they ought to be within two to three centimeters. Well, I get it, and it was it was off. I mean, it was a considerable difference. And I went, ooh, I forgot to fix the file. And so that is a reason for taking and finishing up at your base unit with the rover because they should be within two to three centimeters at the very most. Of course, the, the tip sticking in the ground, you've got your benchmark, which is right up sitting flush. The tip of the pole can sit in the ground and it's even four inches off. I mean, you can have a little bit of elevation change, but I'm rambling, but the point is you have to pay attention to details. You cannot just put numbers in software, they spit out, and you just use it as the gospel. You have to learn to look and make sure that everything is matching up like it should. So um, I'm going to show you something here. So the uh, uh, Opus come back and it said the elevation was 89.673 meters. Now, look down here. These are all, they used seven base stations. So when I bring up uh, Easy Serve that I use, I only used one base station. My unit, uh, the excuse me, the base height for it right here was 89.636. They were 89.673. So we come over and we do uh, 89.673. Uh, is that what it was? 89. Point, yeah, minus 89.6. 636. So three and a half, a little over three and a half centimeters, 3.7 centimeters. I am off from Opus. And but they used seven base stations. I only used one. So this just again makes my point that things they can be different. They can be different based on the number of base stations that you use for processing. And so that is why you will take what Somebody gives you the, the surveyor that's there that has a benchmark set up so that everything is based off that benchmark. You will use those values. But you do have to know, were those values in NAT83 or WGS84? We, we've already talked about what they most likely will be. But you have to know that. Now, if, if for some reason you put you're doing processing and your, your processing is NAT83, but you use WGS84 values, that can actually create problems. It, it's going to put your base where it's not really, and that can actually uh, uh, enter error into the calculations. So if they have done everything correctly on their end, and there wasn't a, a grave error in the person that set up the benchmark, and look, they could have sent some new guy out there and he made a mistake, and we're talking about a considerable difference. So if you have a base unit that the values are way off, and they tell you, hey, these, this is NAT83, here's the state plane. So a lot of times they're going to give them to you in state plane coordinates here in the U.S. If they give you those coordinates and you post-process your base unit, you ought to be very, very close. If for some reason there is a huge difference, you got to stop and you got to find out why. Did you make an error? And if you did not, you, you're going to have to you send them your Opus results and say, hey, this is what I got. And my antenna, I was at this height. Hopefully you took a picture. You took a picture of where you measured it so that you know. And they may go back and it was Bubba's first day on the job and Bubba really messed up. And, and that's why their numbers are off. So I have done work for clients where there was an error made, and it might have been a, a entry error. They gave, they entered it in and sent, sent an email, and they gave you the wrong values. But you have to pay attention and make sure that everything is very similar. If it's not, you have to find out why. So enough of that. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so what you're looking at is MLID Studio, and this particular software is in beta version. It's in beta release 10, and it hasn't been updated since, uh, I think, October, either September or October of 21. So there are issues when trying to process ground control points and then export out the files to bring into uh, photogrammetry software. 
once I work around all of these problems and know that it is a smooth process, I will make a separate video and I'll come back and post the link down in the description of this video, but it's not even worth me running through and then getting to the end and saying, well, here's all the problems with the output file. So I'm going to skip on and go to easy serve. I'll show you that. Uh, and hopefully in the near future, there will be fixes and uh, working with in Emlyn Studio will be a very smooth process and you can output files in various uh, coordinate reference systems and what have you. So sorry about not being able to show this, but when it's fixed and working good, I will make a video on it. So now on to the next section. Okay, so we have EasyServe on the screen. Full disclosure, I have nothing to do with EasyServe. <laughs> I'm just a customer. I sell the Topo Drone uh, products and software. And uh, so if you ever need any of that stuff, please visit dronemappingtools.com. I'm not ashamed to say that. This is just software that's good. It's expensive, but it's good. So let's jump in there and I'm going to show you the process. So I'm going to come here. I'm going to click new. I'm going to process my base unit first. So I go into base, go to my UBX file. I'm going to drag it in. First thing I'm going to do is go down to sites and make sure my antenna height is entered, which was 1.592 to the bottom. Because again, it actually adds, when I click here, see how it's adding it in there? There it is right there. There's your L1 and your L2 offsets right there. All right, so I'm going to click on OK, and then I go to Tools. I click Process Auto. It'll automatically download, so you don't ever have to go and download any of the uh, core station files. It's already done for you. So everything, I had 100% solved. So I'm now ready. So I go back up here to my observations. I now want to use this as a reference. So I right mouse click, and I say Use as Reference. I'm going to do OK. It'll just take the, the data that was already processed. It's going to use that. I could leave this core station here and use it as a reference also, but I'm going to remove that, and we're only going to use our base station. And so now there's a utility in EasyServe. So on your rover, let's go into the rover. Now, when... When we did our initial uh, CSV that we exported out, remember this is the one that I used in EasyServe. This one is what we exported, but I changed the antenna value to only be 2.0 and not 2.134. I drag it over here. If you were using feet, you would change that at this field here. I will now go and bring in the UBX file. So I go up to right here, and I'm going to drag in the UBX file. I'm going to hit Generate, and what it does, it creates an XML file that then has all of the data, and in the XML file, you can see it right, right here. It wasn't there a while ago, so it just put it there. I can now close this. I'm going to take this XML and drag it over, and so it'll bring in the rover, all the, the uh, sites from the CSV file, Bring those all in. So when I click on sites, you can see those here. This says the duration. And see here, every one of these is at, at two meters because I did edit the CSV file. Had I brought in the other one, that would not be the case. Go up to observations. I'm now ready to process. I go tools, process auto. And it will process the entire rover file. And one of the very, very, very nice things about Easy serve that I like is that I can toggle back and forth between uh, feet and meters in any um, particular um, reference system that I want to use. So, like right now, I am in NAT83 using Geoid 18. So, I'll have both my uh, ellipsoid and geoid height. So, when I click, you see everything was fixed, 22 was fixed. And I'm going to click Display Post Processed. So here are all of our post processed coordinates. I can save this out as a text file. I can just right mouse click and then do Save As. 
and then just save it as a post-processed file. So I'll hit save. And then you can just open it up in Notepad if you want to just copy, print it. And so what I'll do is save it like that. And then when I do generate the report for the surveying firm, then this will be included in there. So it'll show exactly which geoid I'm using, the datum, system, everything. It, it's going to just show all of it there. Okay. Now, if I want to export out the CSV for Pix4D, I just go to Export. I go to Sites. And then you can pick um, how you want. So it's all processed. Or I could do all sites, which would include the base. So a lot of times I actually do that. And then it, depending on which what my customer wants, whether they want ellipsoid or orthometric, then I already have a bunch of presets here to where I can uh, export out. Whether And also it would depend because if you're going to do UTM, then I would have picked UTM. But like right now, I am in Geoi, uh, excuse me, NAT83 uh, Geographic. If I want to change to a different system or just compare the coordinates, I can just go here and go to uh, Mapping System Selector. And down here, so like State Plane, that's what most of my people, that's what they're going to be working in. So now if I wanted to switch to State Plane, I do that, come down to uh, Mississippi West. Boom, right there. I'm now in Mississippi West. So, but it's in, they work in feet. So then I'd still go up to tools. And what I've asked is that they would put a shortcut buttons right here that I can go have my top five reference systems. Maybe I'm using Tennessee, UTM, 983 Geographic, um, you name it, what I'm using. And then have one right here to automatically just switch between meters and feet. So easy serve. If you're listening, those will be very, very nice and make this program just so much more user friendly when you're getting files in from different folks that are, have a lot of different stuff. So now I just go to options and I'm going to general. And I'm going to change from metric to U.S. survey feet. And I could even change between, I mean, if you're in uh, lat long, decimal degrees or degrees, minutes and seconds. I do that. And boom, just like that, I'm in feet. So whatever system you want to be in, this transforms just on the fly. So transformations are just a piece of cake to drop down and pick which system you want to use, export it out, and that's it. So you may have one person says, I need it this way. Another person says, I need it in this. Well, with easy serve, that's very easy to do. So what we're going to do, I'm going to come back. Let me switch back over. So I'm going to do um, selector for my mapping system. And I'm going to go back to geographic NAT83. That's what we're going to stay in. Okay. And I need to be back. I'm going to stay in meters. So we'll go to options, general, oops, and meters right there. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to go to tools. I'm going to export my sites. I do want to export all sites to so include my base. I just like to have that in the uh, photogrammetry stuff. So I am in lat long. I do want to, um, I'm going to export it in uh, ellipsoid. So if I click on this, you're going to see that it is in ellipsoid height. If I, if I had one, if I pick one I've done in geoid, now it's going to have the orthometric uh, selected right here, MSL. Okay, so I may I could export out both, but it's important that your ground control points, and that's what we're exporting out is ground control points, um, and the output in your mapping system are all on the the same system. So anyway, that's that's how you would export the file out. So I'm going to pause here, and we're ready to move on to processing the images, and we're going to use TopoDrone to do PPK processing on the flight that we did. All right, I'll clean up. We'll be right back. All right, so this is where the magic happens. We have done all the hard work. I mean, literally going out, flying, putting out ground control points, doing all of that. That, that was the hard part. But this, if you are using a TopoDrone system, this is where the magic happens, and you're about to see why. So 
And yes, we're going to cover, you can do photogrammetry without PPK flights, but you're going to be impressed when you see uh, the workflow and uh, the accuracy when you're using a PPK system. So anyway, I flew this with the Mavic 2 uh, Pro with the uh, Topo Drone PPK on it. The Air 2S will be out in two weeks. The accuracy, that has the same camera. The accuracy on that is going to be exactly what you see here. And uh, it's, it's going to be pretty remarkable. So let's dive in and get busy. So on the Topo Drone software, I'm going to just show you the settings really quick. Now I use this for LiDAR processing. So it actually has additional features. If you are only doing photogrammetry and only doing uh, PPK processing, then you just wouldn't have these additional tabs, okay? And uh, and you can actually add on like for static post processing. So if you wanted to post process a base, then you can do that. Now, when you do a rover with um, for ground control points, then there's it would not do that. So anyway, all right. So I'm going to look at the settings for geotagging and. I have GLONASS and Galileo uh, enabled for the satellites. And the only, so I use PIX4D. If you use Metashape or 3D Survey, then these are the options for writing out the files. You can take the data and use it into a, another system. You may have to alter the format of the file, but when you select one of these three, it is ready just to bring in to that software. But again, all the data will be in the file and it will be there. Um, rename, so burn exif, I, this, I mean, it's checked, but um, we want to rename, what we're using it for is to rename the file to a new name. But as far as the data that's going to be used for updated PPK information, that's going to be in this file that is written out externally as well. We are going to be in, um, so our coordinate type, now if we're going to do UTM, we can do it as uh, X, Y, and Z. So I can, I'll do that. And so th the fact is, if you're going to, if you want to burn the information into the EXIF, like update the EXIF data, then you do need to pick the correct one. So we're going to do UTM 16. So in this case, I do want to have X, Y, Z for my coordinate type. If we were going to do uh, geo, so like uh, either NAT83 geo reference or WGS84 uh, geo, then we would want to stay with the uh, latitude. And on this uh, geotagging algorithm, not going to get into the details of that, but this one, you just want to leave it on increased uh, time weight. In other words, it's looking at the time of the photo. If there's ever any issues with the event matching up with the photo, then the software is going to look at the GPS time to try to match up to the best software, uh, to the best image. This is uh, really a non-issue when you're using the Topo Drone system. When you use like the, the add-on system, um, the, like a snap-on type deal, you're going to have missed events, missed photos, and that's where this function really comes into play to try to help with that. Um, so that's that's really designed to work with that uh, and fix those problems. Um, let's see. That's it. So I hit save. Yep. Now I'm going to come back over to PPK processing, and just so you know, over here, this is I'm going to go up. So this is the, the folder. This is the same folder structure we've been working with. And in my Mavic 2 images, I go to DCM, media. The, I, this is what I just copied straight off the drone. Okay, so there's the one shot. I ran a double grid mission. And just so you know, I followed the recommended um, um, protocol that Topo Drone, they give you a, a training video that anybody can watch. And I took the Mavic uh, 2 Pro up to 200 feet, because that's what I was going to fly the mission at. I took it up 200 feet. I did a manual focus 
at 200 feet. I did, well, actually, I did autofocus, changed it to manual. I then um, set my um, exposure manually to be exactly what it needed to be. And then I ran this in Drone Deploy, and I set Drone Deploy to use the DJI uh, settings. So in other words, I did not want Drone Deploy to override that. And we'll talk more about this later because we're going to do uh, some uh, focus calibration and calibrating the focal length. <laughs> you want to see, we, might, we really probably won't need it, but we still can calibrate that. And when you're, when you let the drone, uh, when you let uh, like uh, drone deploy, change that during flight. If they ever, if you ever use an app, not drone deploy, but if you use any other app and they, it changes your um, settings throughout. Maybe your ISO is changing, your aperture is changing. Th that is problematic because when you want accurate uh, photogrammetry and accurate maps, you need the focal length to stay the same because you're going to calibrate that focal length, and I'm going to show you how. And so you want that to literally stay the same throughout the entire mission. So let me stop talking. Let's get in here. So images folder, we're going to select this folder right here, but I'm going to go to Mavic 2 images, DCM, and there's my folder. Okay. Now it wants to know where's the GNSS file that was on uh, the external, the added topo drone GNSS. So we're going to go here. Let's go up one. PPK files. And I turned it on and off a couple times. So it was this, this last one, the one with the most data, obviously. So I'm going to do OK. And then it says, well, what is my drone model? I'm running the Mavic 2 Pro. I also have the Phantom 4 Pro kit on this. And soon we're going to do a little uh, shootout between the Mavic 2, the Phantom 4, and the um, Phantom 4 RTK, just to show you how that compares. Uh, let's see. So we don't have to do anything there. Base station. So I'm going to go back, go into my RS2 base. I go to the UBX right here. Okay. Now, I'm going to be working in, I'm in NAT83, so I want... I'm going to output NAT83 over here, so I need and must use NAT83 here. I do not want to use WGS here and then switch it. I'm going to keep it the same. So what we need to do is I'm going to switch over and where, okay, so let me open up a new folder. That out of the way. So uh, Rover. And post process. NAT 83. Okay, so I have this file that I had saved earlier when I processed all this stuff in EasyServe. So now I'm just going to copy because this is, you can see right up here tells you everything. NAT 83, 2011, geographic, and then uh, the datum, of course, is NAT 83. Now this is the ellipsoid height. Where if I was going to work in geoid height, then I could I would be using this, but I am working in ellipsoid height, and then we can adjust it later. But anyway, let's go ahead and copy lat latitude into here. Okay. And longitude. And elevation. All right, and the antenna height was 1.592. Remember that from earlier. And let's see, so projection, I am going to use NAT83, and I'm going to go ahead and go with uh, 16, UTM zone 16N. How about that? Okay, and so now I'm just going to click start, and it will run through the process. And it'll take just a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll let this run. I'll fast forward through this. And then after it's done, we'll um, open everything up, move it over to Pix4D, and keep rolling. But you can see here it created this output folder. So within the images folder, it'll create a subfolder called output. 
and that is where it will write the new images. So it will never edit your original images. Um, that's that's important because you know you just wouldn't want to mess with those. You want the original. Now look, it so it's run everything. Everything is green. Everything matched up. People that are using the uh, the the uh, the DIY PPK kits you will always run into issues where your photos are not there and extra events are there. It is just, it's part of the system. This one here, whoop, I pull it up and it's green. Very nice uh, and works very smooth. So if I had some that were that didn't match, I'd have to go into manual matching and try to, uh, to do that. But since they are all matched up, we don't have to worry about that. And now it will go through and just literally update Every photo, just one after another, um, you know, it'll take a little bit of time to just write because it's copying, editing, send it out, and then uh, and then it's updating the file as well, the output file. So again, I'm going to let this run. I'll be quiet, and uh, we'll be back after it's finished. All right, it is done. I accidentally turned my recording off halfway. I was just going to speed through. But anyway, okay, so it is done. What I'm going to do now is get everything, get the files copied over to Pix4D. So I'm running Pix4D on a second machine so I can record and run Pix4D simultaneously. So we're going to I'll pause right now, get everything copied over, and then we'll open it back up and keep rolling. Hey, and by the way, if this is helpful, if you are still with me, this is probably a, one of my longer videos. Give me a thumbs up, man. Help me out. Just give me a like. And then uh, if this is helpful and you're ready to see more of this, I've been in a lot of recording and now trying to get stuff actually put together and start pushing out the good, helpful videos. So if you like it, subscribe. And uh, again, it'll help me out. Uh, share it with your friends. Let them know, hey, this guy's producing some stuff that could be helpful. I'd appreciate that. Let me get it moved over and I'll see you in Pix4D. All right, so we have Pix4D open and we're going to go ahead and bring all of the files, uh, images into Pix4D and get this processing. So let me go ahead and get started and we get to slow points. Maybe I can talk a little while we're doing, but I need to pay attention, right? All right, next. Add images. And a lot of the programs work the same way, or, you know, going to have similarities. Bringing your photos in, you got to set what reference system you're using, what, what are the images based on. And um, so let's go to here, mapping, and photogrammetry, output, updated tags, right here. I don't know why those look a little janky, but they do. But I know they're good images, so we're going to hit OK. I'm going to do Open. Right, I'm going to hit Next. OK. All right, now the first thing I have to do, so the file was written, you remember it was written by TopoDrone for UTM. But right now this is by default to WGS84, so I'm going to change this to... UTM zone 16 in, and we'll go down to NAT8311 right there. Okay, we hit okay. And now I'm ready to uh, find, locate my file. Hit browse. Output. Pix4D is where it went. And so this file here, do that, and we'll hit OK. And it was YX, so northern easting uh, format or order. Hit OK. I'm going to hit. Uh, so one thing I'm going to point out real quick. Sorry about that. I'm going to hit advanced. When, if you ever work in a program and you, you bring in ground control points, maybe you're in a trial or you're using your program and then your, your ground control points are floating up in the air and it doesn't match with anything, that is always going to be because you have your two different 
uh, systems. Your your uh, ground control points are in uh, orthometric or geoid height, and then your images were based on um, ellipsoid height. And so you always have to make sure that everything is the same. And so I know that our ground control points that I processed in EasyServe, I exported those out in ellipsoid height. I'm specifying ellipsoid height here. So everything will, they'll be the same. And if they're not, it is always because you, you have two different uh, elevations um, specified for those two different um, systems. So I'm going to go ahead and hit next. And it should, SID defaults to the NAT8311 UTM for the output. So I'm going to hit next. And I left everything in meters. If you are going to be, if your client needs it in feet, if you have another program that you're going to use to convert that over, you can, or if you need to do that here, you know, now is the time. But if you are going to specify the output, like in PIX4D, if the output's going to be in uh, U.S. survey feet, then I would have had to export the uh, ground control points in uh, U.S. survey feet. So you just got to know what your client needs and make sure everything matches and it will go smoothly. All right, so this is the area that should look very familiar, and we're ready to hit go. So I'm going to go ahead and start processing. And what I will do, I am not going to record this entire thing. I'll let this go for just a little bit. I will probably uh, hyper speed this a little bit, and then once we get back and it's done, the next step we're going to do is we're going to import our ground control points, and we'll import them as checkpoints. And then I'm going to go through them. We're going to look at the images and see how close they are before we even match them up. And then I'll let you just walk through. I'm going to go through all of them, match them up so that we see what our, uh, we can run a report on the errors without using any ground control points. And then if we need to uh, use a ground control point, then we will. But you'll, we'll just take a look at that and see how that pans out. But again, I'm going to turn me off. So if I, give me one second here. I need to do this. Okay. And we're going to get that one. Fade it over. Okay. I'm off the screen. I'm going to let this record for a little bit. And I'll probably pause the recording. And then once it is finished, then we'll, we'll come back and... Um, resume bringing in the ground control points. Okay, so the report has popped open. So let's uh, let's take a quick look at that. Give me one second. Um, I saw one big red dot in the middle of the screen. So uh, camera optimization, I like to always look at that and see that that is a, a very small number. So I accidentally brought in the test photo. Good grief. I don't know why I did that, but um, anyway, I did, and that's why it is sitting in the middle of the screen with a big fat red dot. Um, so let's, oops. Yeah, on the ground, we're gonna disable that, and it should just be deleted, anyway. Nice way to mess up a, a pretty screen. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, um, we are going to bring in our ground control points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause my recording and then restart it so that I have a, this is a new segment. So that we're going to bring in ground control points. What I'm going to do is go up to Project. I'm going to go to GCP Manager. And I'm going to import my GCPs. And you can see that the ground control point is in the same reference system as everything else. And that's exactly what you want. Now, I do know on ground control points, those were actually exported out in uh, Easting Northing, so XY uh, order. So it's always good to, like when you save a file out, I'd always just put in there what your order was. But let's go to... Um, Right here, going to mapping, photogrammetry, 
And this is my Pix4D. Let's see if I can move that out. See where I put XY? I put that into the file name. So it's always good just to put that in there so you don't have to hunt for it or pop open an error and tell you you're in the, in the wrong order. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK. All right. Now I'm going to do OK here. All right, so here are all, I mean, again, all this stuff just matches up. This is this is down in the uh, ditch. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to just turn it up and see that nothing's floating up in the air. So that's good. All right, so we're all exactly where we should be there. Now, let's uh, zoom in and start taking a look. These cross lines will be a, a good a good start. And let me close that. Ah, uh, sorry. Okay. Ooh All right. Now this right here, this is, look at that. This right here is, there has been, no, all I'm going to do is show you, I'm going to scroll down, and you're going to be able to see in these images where the, the point is at, where it thinks it should be. I mean, you can't get any closer than that. That right there, I mean, yeah, I could go in and mark. We're going to be within a a half an inch, an inch. That right there is, that is smoking, my friend. That is, that's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Okay, so I'm going to go through. And again, remember I drew the chalk line and I put this little hash mark. You always want to do that so that you never... Question. So let, let's say the point was in the middle, and you're going, "Oh crap! Which which corner was it?" You put that hash mark right there, and you know which one it is. But I'm just going to go going through all of these. Look at them. Just boom, boom, boom. That is that is amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right. So then this was on the other end of the line. Same thing. Of course, I mean they're right beside each other, so I wouldn't expect anything else. Um. But now we're going to still mark these and then run a report and see, well, what does PIX4D show us in, in terms of error in, in reporting? So there's that. So I'm going to back out. Um, here is, uh, so again, this remember we were up on the top side up here. This is over where the stop sign was at. So let me take a look here. Um, sorry, let's go boom again. Man, that is just that's nice right there. That is that is nice. That is money. Every one after another, right there. You're just seeing image after image. You know, when you do, and I'm going to after this, I'm going to do the same thing, but with the un pp the non ppk images, the original images. When I guarantee you, when I bring that in, you're going to have, there are going to be points over here, over there. It's going to be kind of just all over the place um, because that's just, when you have non-PPK images, this is what you deal with, okay? So going down, this is a green, yeah. Look at that right here. I'm just going to run down. I mean, that's almost as good as I'm going to be. I mean, I can see this one right here. I mean, I, I could move it over a, a one inch right there. But mm, that is so good. So good. And then we come down. So this is a lower elevation down here. So let's see where we are on that one. Still absolutely right on as far as XY goes. Folks, that is... Mm, that is so good. And this is when, so depending on what kind of work you're doing, you can say, you know what, I don't, I don't know, especially with elevation. If elevation is rock solid. You can go, I, I don't need ground control points for the kind of work I'm doing. I will always do ground control points because I'm turning into surveyors and engineering firms, and I just, I got to have that redundancy and that uh, confirmation. But this right here, mm, just and and when, so in two weeks when the the Air 2S comes out, you can rest assured that the 
the accuracy on that is going to be just the same. Okay, so this one, I did it on this side of the um, line, and then I came down here on the opposite end for, for this point down here. And I can't remember if I actually put it dead center. No, it was on the opposite side. So just down a little ways. So the first point that we just looked at, so this one over here is on the inside on this end, and I just came out a little ways and put it on the outside of the line. And here again, these images are gonna all be right on the very outside of that line, just spot on. All right, so one more, and then we'll just get busy marking. So what I wanna do is this one, so now, is that one the one in the ditch? No, that's in the top. Let's see here. Okay, so that is in... No, that's not in the ditch. I was just looking at it incorrect. Look, see there? So that's a, a good... You know, that had a nice little drop right there. Again, I'm just going to arrow down through here. Look at that. Hmm. So... I'm going to mark them. So we're tired of, I could sit here and just hem haul and praise this all day long. But what I'm going to do now is I want to, you know what I hope is that, uh, give me one second. I hope I haven't been blocking with my stupid face on the, uh... okay, no, you still been able to see it. Thought I was going to be blocking. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn uh, I'm going to get me off. We're, we're going to turn me off the screen. Right here, let me uh, fade. Okay, y'all don't need to see me. So now what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go through and mark these ground control points. And so I'm going to maximize my screen there. All right. So now what I, okay, so one thing I need to do is I'm going to go up to my GCP manager and I'm going to change all of these to uh, checkpoints. Edit all types. I meant to do that when I brought them in. I forgot. All right, so we'll change because I don't want any ground control points. I just want to see what the accuracy is. So I'm going to hit OK. I don't know why my this computer is running slow. Like I'm not running anything else. This is on a separate computer. And by golly, you would think that this thing is. All right. All right. So let's see here. I'm multitasking. Trying, trying, trying. All right, so now let's go ahead and start marking the ground control points. And so here's one. All right, so again, this is just, and my mouse is moving a little funny. Mouse is being a little weird here. Okay. All right, so uh, give me one second. We're going to... No. No. So what I want to do is go to the ones where I have targets because I can get dead center on those. I mean, look at that. Bam. One. Now, that's good. This is a long, tedious process. So when you're just wanting to 
let's say you've got a you're relying on ground control points then you know this is where you really have to kind of spend the time to uh, go through each one of them mark them get them exactly right now when you're just needing to um, you're just doing it for check purposes you probably don't have to do near as many so this is this is more about showing off right here this is I'm gonna go through all of them but again this is uh this is more of show and tell than than relying so when you don't have the PPK then it's uh it's actually much more critical so I'm gonna hit apply okay. and I'm gonna have to just go through I'm gonna go through all of them 22 it's a lot. But I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna record every bit of it because I want I want it to be seen what, what I mark and that uh, nobody thinks I did any funny business and kind of got a little I mean because if you went through and marked where the point was, I mean you could alter your um, your readings so for the sake of I can fast forward through all of it or I'll just record it and then give you the link to go to the next segment right I right, just so want to hit apply Oop. now let's let me zoom on in a little bit oops not that far I do like uh, I like squares because now when I have when I have these uh, lines on the the uh, parking lot it makes it real easy to uh, to do your markings because you you're especially when they're when they're in agreement with they run north and south so now I can sit here and come right and of course you know the further away you get you start to get like this is a image where it's far away the further you start to have some pixelation on the edges and then it becomes a little bit of you kind of trying to interpret where the the true line is. <coughs> Excuse me. Getting there. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk, and I'm just going to I'm going to play some music. You want to watch? You can watch. I'll probably speed this up into like double time and triple time, so that. But I'm going to record all of the all of the markings so that that part is accounted for because I'm I'm sitting here touting accuracy and when we see the report I want to to really show well where did, where did I mark the points so I'll just be quiet until I'm completely done enjoy the music or jump ahead to the next sec segment
So you may be asking, well, why are you not doing automatic marking? And again, I just, for the sake of this um, kind of, I mean, a tutorial, but also the, for the sake of proving the, the accuracy of the PPK system. So I'm, I'm sitting here and just going through and marking every single one of them, doing it where if somebody wants to watch and see what I'm doing, then you can see, you can check it out. But that is, uh, that's why, because I mean, I could do, so look, so after you've done quite a few of them, I can hit automatic marking and it'll go through and it'll mark them. And then I can uh, kind of zoom in here and then come down and look at each one to see is that, is it where I think it should be, the yellow. So like that one might be just a, a hair off. So, you know, the automatic marking, it's, it's good. I mean, and, and when I'm doing other jobs of foot tolerance, I mean, if it's any of these are going to be close enough, but when we're sitting here wanting to prove down to the centimeters, I'm going to take time and I mean, get it very, very accurate. Even that one's can't mark that one. Okay. Why? All right, I'll be quiet. I'm going to just go back to uh, finishing these up.
All right, this is going to be the last one. There might be one or two more, but I am not. Uh, this is more like, this is kind of like more than work out in the field marking ground control points. This is tedious. And yeah, this is, this is kind of like not fun. But if you want, well, especially if you don't have uh, ground control. Well, if you don't have PPK, this is, this becomes very necessary um, but anyway we're gonna I'm just about done with this one and we're gonna we're gonna re rerun it so we can tell us where we are I gotta cut out here in a little bit and go to Good Friday service, and then I'll come back after that and finish this up. This is this baby's getting published up tonight. I don't care if I gotta stay up all night. And and then look, so some of this stuff I probably should have zoomed out, you know, because. You may have seen other videos. The more you zoom in, the more accurate. But I mean, I am I'm very confident on my my point right there. But it's starting to get a little a little pixelated. Okay, we are we're done. We're done with that. I'm not marking anymore. So the ones that uh, let's see four and five. So I could uh, I'm going to remove. Remove, remove, remove. And number 21, where are you? Oh, that was my base unit. So actually, so look, this is, I mean, it should, of course, it's going to be on the ground. So depending on what, what angle. But anyway, I'm going to remove that one because we're, we're not going to use that. Okay. All right. So now, oh, number nine. Why? Oh, you know what? So this is the one, I didn't have a good clear, I'm gonna remove that. I don't wanna, for accuracy purposes, I mean, yeah, if I'm trying to do elevation, um, but we got, we got a lot, so I'm gonna remove that. Okay, so now I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna do a process, I'm gonna re-optimize. Re now that we have our ground control points, or checkpoints, I should say, so we're going to re-optimize, and then we will generate our report after that is done. And so that'll be able to tell us where we are. And uh, I know that it's going to be good, but let's uh, we're going to take take a look and see. And mm, this is just something that's there. I mean, we don't even need we do not need ground control points to bring this one in tight. I have checkpoints to, to prove it's tight, but we don't need ground control points. I don't think. So let's look at the uh, elevation data after it's done. So let's, uh, let's see where it's at. All right, we should be just about ready to pop open a window saying it's done, and then I'll generate the the report. All right, so let's. All right, I got too many mice is going on here. Okay, so I'm going to dismiss that. Now what I want to do is I'm going to generate. I'm going to come up to process. I'm going to um, generate the quality report, and so this will take just a second to generate and then we're going to take a look and see look at our errors on that so while this is loading um man i just i hope um, some of this is useful what i'm going to do after this one is i'm going to load up the uh, images i'm going to run it again i'm going to just show you how off the original images were without ppk I will mark some of the points 
uh, I don't have to go through every one. I can just, I'll just mark some of them. Go through, and I'm going to generate that, let you look at it. It will not take a rocket scientist to realize, ooh, there is a huge, huge difference here. And so, anyway, we are just about done with the error report. I'll let it come up. And who knows, maybe I will go ahead and mark all of them just so it's a uh, apples to apples comparison and let you see what the what the difference is. Okay. And let's uh let's merge move this over here. Okay. All right, quality report. Let's run down this thing. Actually, let's uh let's go ahead and go to PDF and go to full screen. Like they'll see it. Okay. All right. So we have no GCPs because they're all control uh, checkpoints. There's our camera optimization. You see that? That's that's really good. And then close you. Now let's go ahead and scroll on down. We want to get to the part where we're looking at the errors. I'm just going to tell you that right there, that says it all. That is absolutely, that is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, if you're new to this, uh, so what the accuracy is supposed to be is uh, three to four centimeters. We are in, so we do have right here in some of these, we're two, three, three, three centimeters. Over here, there's a three centimeter. Now one, now that now we're in the millimeters, that is just that is crazy, crazy accurate. And look at our look at our elevation accuracy. That is off the chart accurate. That is so two and a half centimeters, uh, five millimeters, um, four centimeters, three centimeters, three three one two going down two centimeters. Hmm. That right there. You can do work with that all day long, all day, with confidence, making money, turning it in to people. Again, I'm going to always have checkpoints to to show this and say this, but I, this is this is there are no ground control points. This is just the data as it is. So look, if you want, I am going to put down in the video below. I'm going to put the. Um, links to the raw data. So the images that I took, I'm going to give you my log files from the RS2 units, raw, so that you can process it and do it yourself. You can process it, see what you get. Um, and then if you want trials for the software, uh, and you don't have anything that, so the topo setter, I'll get you a, a trial for that. Anything else, I mean, you can just uh, you can get with the companies and get trials. If you have your other photogrammetry software, you can try it there and you know see what see what it shows. But this is it. Now I'm going to go ahead and pause. I actually got to leave and uh, head to church, but I will be back. And then we're going to do the images without any uh, PPK. I'm going to show you what the error is on the images without PPK. Then. That's, that's it. We're going to wrap it up, call it a night, call it a video, and uh, hopefully it's been educational. It took you through the entire process. Uh, and again, if I can be of help, if I can answer questions, let me know if you're interested. The, uh, the, the Air 2S is going to be the most affordable PPK drone on the market. We'll be out in two weeks after this video is released, and it's uh, got the Hasselbad uh, camera on it. It's it's going to be the same results. You're going to get the same kind of accuracy on it that you have here on this Mavic 2 Pro Topodrome PPK. So let's pause. I'll uh, be back. We're going to run through the non-PPK images. That'll be a lot faster. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Just get it on there, mark them, let you see the accuracy, and uh, call it a wrap. All right. We are now going to run through with the regular images. So I now have them copied over.
All right, it's, it's pretty simple. Next, add images. All right, and this, I didn't copy in the one ground photo, so I don't have to worry about having a red dot in the middle of this one. Open, next. Right. And of course, you probably see this, but I mean, you, when you bring stuff in like this, it's unedited, so it'll just default to a five meter horizontal, 10 meter vertical, which is about right. All right, so I'm gonna hit next. And we'll just stay with, um, no, we don't, we don't, because I'm bringing in, give me one second. I'm gonna bring in my con uh, ground control points, so you do have to, they all have to be the same, so. Nat 83, that's what we're going to switch to. And this time it's just going to be standard 3D maps, finish. Okay, still same area. Let's so check this and this and start. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm not going to sit and record all this. I'm going to pause this as soon as it's done. Then uh, I'll bring the recording back up. We'll, we will bring in the ground control points and then go ahead and start looking at where those show up in the image matching. So uh, anyway, as soon as this is done, I'll start the recording back up and we'll see where they are. Okay, so the initial processing is finished and the very first thing you're already going to see, let me turn it around. Um, we have a 3% relative difference on the cameras and initial parameters. So, I mean, that's already a, a, a huge difference there. We were at 0.2 something last time. So quarter of a percent. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead, nothing to, uh, else to really look at here. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and I'm going to bring in the ground control points. So we'll go to Project, GCP Manager. I want to import. We're just going to use the very same file we did before. Um, mapping right here. And it should be this one. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK. And I'm going to go ahead and change these, edit all types, and change them to checkpoints. Okay. I'm going to do OK. Man, I wish I knew why this thing was running so slow. This is a, a good machine, and I'm feeding it through. I have a dual PC setup, so guys that like to do gaming stuff um, would kind of do this, but I don't, it, uh, it just seems to be running very, very slow. OK, all right, now we already have... What did I do? OK, so... I thought I set, hmm, okay, so let's go back. Remember earlier, I said if that happens, the something is different or wrong with the coordinate system. Someone do advanced. Uh, this is supposed to be set to geoid uh, at zero, which means you're at the ellipsoid height. So I'm hit OK. Now it's going to have to um, re-optimize and put everything right on the right level. So if that ever happens, you know you have made a boo-boo. All right, so I'll let it finish and then we'll be back to evaluate in just a second. Okay, so now both the GCPs and my photos are set to ellipsoid height. So everything is matched up there. So let's get the cameras turned off. And so really what I want to do is the first thing we want to do, you can just already tell about accuracy by, so remember last time, this is where we should be right there. So let's go ahead and let's zoom on in. All right. So you can see that we have uh, a good bit of 
of distance there. So from here to there, where when we had the PPK, they were just already where they belong. So we're, we're every bit of, um, of a couple feet off. And so let's go ahead and look at a few others. So here was a target. Wow, that one's gonna be way off. Okay, so this is a this is a two foot target, two foot cross. Actually, more than two feet. This one right here, way way off. And so it's gonna be the same. Look at there. So drastically off. And let's go ahead and go over to the parking lot. Now these are supposed to be up on this line right there, okay? And they, they're they they're down here, they're supposed to be up there. So these were going across the very center and uh, man, that is, that's terrible, okay? So that's bad. Now let's go to, um, let's go up here to the front. So we had this pretty deep ditch running down through the middle, so I'm going to click. This was now that one actually is uh, that's not too bad. That one there is okay, but then this one's off, and then we'll start to go down down the list, and they'll they'll begin. Your better ones are always at the top, and then the further down you go, they typically are getting worse and worse with um with accuracy. So yep, those are all off. Now we come down into the ditch. There we go. All right. So not um, may have one or two that's going to be okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to mark every one of these just like I did before. I don't really feel like marking all of them, but I am because then I want to see that we marked all the same ones and just do everything the same so that we can see what the accuracy of non-PPK versus PPK. And it is, it's not even going to be close. So I'll do that. I'm not going to um, bore you with that. Well, I may record and fast forward, but I'm going to pause the video now and then get all those marked and then we'll be back. You know, and it's where this stuff though, I mean, if you really need it for, let's say you don't have uh, PPK, this is what gets I mean, you know, you need it. You got to be tedious to get it right, but then you get tired of doing it, especially on a big job. So, um, having a PPK with about three control points would be good in some cases, or if you need to, you can't mark that one. All right, I'm going to have to shut my door. My alarms are still going off down there. Okay, so we're... All right, got the... Get apply. Okay, so there's that one. Now let's do this one here. And it should be over here. So I actually set it right on that crack at the end of the line. So I've got one customer who, well not a customer, he's a potential customer, but he does landscaping and dirt work but mainly on um, small one to five acre lots. And they would love to be able to do, um, get some good topo stuff on, on lots. I mean, so it's going to be manicured lawns that they just need to do, uh, make adjustments to. 
And so this right here using a getting that little Air 2S PPK or even uh, getting the kit to put on a Mavic 2 um, Pro would be a nice little setup for them because he's not having to work for a survey. This is just for himself. To, they have to go out and shoot these shots. Um, oops. There we go. Ooh, that one's a little fuzzy. I don't know where that one. Oh, that one's out of out of range. All right, let's. Okay, so that one's out of picture too. All of these are. All right, there's that. Oof, man, I'm getting, getting tired of this already. All right, and here's a target on this one. See, I love these little black and white targets, and you can you can hone in on them. Now I will tell you this: uh, when you've got them. If you haven't centered, like if you haven't done the auto centering, well then when you hit the space bar and go to a big, big screen, you can just click right on it, but that's kind of silly when you can just hit apply, come in and zoom it in to the right level. And now they're all just right where they need to be. They can just go down through here. So keep in mind that, I mean, you know, I can, so having these as control points, this is going to tell me how much error we had in our original flight. I can make, we're going to be able to take, I could take all of these and um, turn them into control points, not checkpoints, and force the map to adhere to the points. But the issue is that, they it it's like uh, taking a big, um, a big sail, you know, just a big sail, and your or a, a cushion. You take one of these bedspreads, big thick bedspread, and you you poke it down, and you got little rivets, and you rivet it down. What it fluffs up everywhere. There's not a rivet, and so the same thing happens in photogrammetry. In that you. It'll be very accurate right here at this point, but if you had other checkpoints all over outside of your, your ground control points, you're going to start to see a lot of error creeping in, um, especially when it's off as much as it is right here. Now, what I'm so we may have, we, we've got a lot of error in XY. Well, it's going to also be interesting to see, well, how much error is there in the, uh, in the Z value? So that's probably, there's going to probably be a lot in in the elevation as well. So we got this much in, all right, hold on. All right, so on the quality report that's been generated, I'm gonna scroll down. So our, um, oddly enough, our, when I re-optimized, the relative difference uh, reduced. Um, let's get on down. Come on, come on. Next section. Here we go. So here's our errors right here. So much more in the X. Um, so in the Easting, we've got, you know, two, three and almost four meters difference. And so now we had a couple here that were a third one. It was really tight right there. Uh, but then it was off on the, so this was good in the X and Y, but then in the vertical, it was almost, two, you know, a little over two and a half. All these two and a half, two and a half, one meter, you cannot, um, this is no good. So you couldn't do any work with that. That is crazy. So anyway, Okay, so there's even more. This video has gone on and on and on. So what I'm going to do is we're going to stop it right here. And I am going to do a, a second part when we go. And it'll be a, a short second part. But we'll still do a second part going into 
doing the deliverables. So we're going to go back, we'll actually use the, the PPK, do the deliverables from that. Then we will take this particular set here. We're going to use ground control points to button it down. And then we're going to take both of those. So we're going to take the original uh, PPK cloud, point cloud that we generate. And then we're going to take this point cloud from this one with no uh, PPK. And I'm going to bring it into LiDAR 360. And we're going to do, uh, or global map, or either one. But I'm going to do a check. And so we're going to take um, what we have already exported out. We'll bring it into there and just kind of check it. And we'll, we'll use some of these other checkpoints um, that maybe were not used as uh, control points. And let's see what the what the error ends up being in those areas um, after we've done um, tightened it up with ground control points. So anyway, that'll be in the next video. Uh, and I'll probably get that done in the next couple of days. If you need PPK equipment, visit dronemappingtools.com. If there's a video you want to see, yes, I'm here. I want to promote what we sell, but I also want to do videos that, that help people. So if there's questions on anything, if there's something else you want to see a video on, put it in the description below. If you have questions, ask below or go to dronemappingtools.com and just use the contact us page and send an email in. I'll answer it. We have a chat box on the web page. I have that on my phone. I'll try to answer questions um, as soon as possible. So anyway, thank you for watching this video. Please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to be aware and be kept up to date with new videos coming out. And um, I hope it's helpful. See you guys in the next video. Adios.